I've worked on the ecology of the grassy box woodlands and the derived native grasslands for a few years and I probably come to it from a slightly different perspective. It's about how to fit the biodiversity within these agricultural landscapes into our production system. So we've had some fantastic talks all about our production on these systems. I'll be talking about diversity within that but also focusing a little bit more on the biodiversity and the sort of things that you might do to help promote that biodiversity within your paddocks. So I will move straight into it. What I'm going to talk about, we've got sort of half an hour, 45 minutes, is um, uh, a background about um, the diversity in the grassy box gum woodlands and the native grasslands. I'm going to go into the state and transition model. It doesn't sound very exciting, but everybody's talking about knowing what we're managing. So that's going to be an introduction to those different pasture types and how this vegetation community functions. Um, and we're going to look at why grazing and nutrients are the key, key drivers and the levers for managers which people have been talking again about uh, on this so far. So I'll go, we'll have a look at grazing and have a look at what are some of the key parts of grazing that will influence your diversity. And we'll look at a seasonal grazing guide and um, uh, uh, Phil pointed out the jewels in the landscape. I've also inserted the seasonal grazing guide in that for you. Um, we'll look at recommended stocking rates for uh, plant diversity. Then we're going to go into nutrients. A lot of interest in super phosphate. What are the impacts on native plant diversity of those added nutrients? How do you manage nutrients for productivity and the native plant diversity? Um, just do a little bit on tree health, dieback and managing for natural regeneration, getting the trees back in the system. And just a little bit on weeds, just to show you I haven't forgotten about them. I know they're very important, but um, uh, we're focusing a little bit more on other things. And then I'll just talk about how you can pick up some of these trends. How do you know what's going on in your paddocks or in your uh, bush block um, about a new set of ecological indicators that we've just developed, which uh, work over very short time frames. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, as I spoke, we'll just go through the, the original box gum uh, grassy woodlands. So originally very high diversity, um, in very high conservation condition, we're getting up to between 60, 110 species of uh, native wildflowers and grass species. So sorry Meredith, more wildflowers than grasses, <laughs> but incredible diversity of, of plants in that. So we've got kangaroo grass, poa tussock, we've got the wattles, we mentioned not normally more than about 10%. We've got white box, yellow box and Blakely's red gum. Um, many species of grassland and woodland birds, remor, uh, reptiles and mammals associated with that. And not just your common old eastern grey kangaroo and cockatoo and corellas and so on. You have a lot of very specific special species that go with that. And um, in the woodlands, the tree spacings, you can see in this lovely picture from up near Tamworth, um, big open canopies and often distance uh, spacings between trees. So they're averaging about 30 trees per hectare. So remember that too, when you do revegetation, you don't need to plant huge amounts of trees if you are doing that. So this is including derived native grasslands, which are similar to the natural temperate grasslands. So these are areas that are historically cleared, but the native ground layer is still predominantly native grasses and wildflower. So in fact, with these systems, the diversity, huge amount of diversity, and it's all in that ground layer. You've really only got half a dozen or a dozen tree and shrub species on, on the top. So this is where they occurred, all the way through Queensland, down through New South Wales, on those lovely high fertility soils, basically the sheep wheat belt. So prime wheat sheep belt country, so of course it's been grazed. And um, so more than 90% of its pre-European distribution is estimated to have been cleared. So. Uh, consequently, it's listed federally and uh, at the state level as critically endangered and a threatened ecological community. 
So your native paddocks and properties are really important in these um, ecological communities because most of this occurs on private lands. So of that remaining, so 90% is pretty well cleared, but of that remaining 10% of box gum grassy woodlands, less than 5% meets that minimum condition criteria of what an ecolo a box gum grassy community is. So that means that more than 50% of its cover needs to be native, or there might be 12 non-grass native species in a 0.1 hectare patch. Uh, and then out of that, less than 0.5% fall in the really high conservation value category, where you get that really huge diversity of um, uh, species. So, and of course, increasing intensification. So the pressure on these pastures, paddocks and box gum woodlands over the years, uh, the area is increasing as we get greater intensive land use. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk briefly about um, the, uh, the state and transition model. And there are these, what we'll talk about is knowing what we've got in a sense. So we're talking about these five different primary agricultural land uses that are associated with the ground layer. So we've got this reference ground layer in very original condition. We'll have a look at it more a little bit later. We've got uh, native pasture, uh, which we've heard all about today. I'm gonna divvy it up into a couple of different types of native pasture and we'll go through that. We've got fertilised pasture. Uh, there are sown pastures and crops and enriched grasslands. Now I'm gonna talk more about the first three, not so much about those uh, last two, the sown pastures and crops and the enriched grasslands. Or, but only to say the ones I'm not going to talk very much about, sown pasture. So it's often a, a really key essential component of your whole farm production system. And we've seen Meredith talk about integrating uh, Phalaris and these sort of sown pastures into the system. But it has few if any native species. Um, but keep it in mind because when we look at seasonal timing and stocking density, they become a really important key part of the whole system. And then the other part of this is the enriched grasslands. So that's when often, you know, maybe your fence off an area, really highly fertile area, um, just say you're going to plant trees in it. And basically you get a lot of large perennials, things like Phalaris just uh, dominating. So it's one of the most difficult in terms of restoring, but it's also not really a focus for this presentation. Basically, I'm going to talk about the state and transition model because how we might move the box gum grassy woodland between these different condition and pasture states through changed management, it's one of the best ways we can basically work out whether does a fertilised pasture, can it shift to a reference grassland? If so, why not? How? Just to give you a bit more, a bit of an understanding about how these systems might work and how they may shift around. So here's the state and transition model. What it's basically saying is once upon a time we used to think a system started off really with very little. It was the sort of Clementsian succession story. You got more species, you got more species, it got more complex, then you got to this key point up here where you had lots of complexity in species and that's where it stayed. This is far more realistic. The state and transition model is basically saying we have these different states out there in the grasslands and in the woodlands of how the pastures and the ground layers are and they actually shift backwards and forwards. The arrows, grazing, resting and restoration, or we'll see if this will work. Um, so grazing, resting, restoration. There are triggers that will shift between these states. Uh, basically the little round circles are what is required in terms of what happens to maintain that system. So, uh, for example, we've talked about a reference grassland. Um, we've talked a lot about grazing and resting and fertilisation. We'll go into that into a little bit more detail. As I said, we're not really talking about enriched grassland. This shift uh, potentially here 
very difficult to do. So there will be different levels at which these can shift in states, but the real triggers and keys uh, and what we've been talking about um, will tend to concentrate on uh, grazing and we'll look at uh, phosphorus because they are some of the key things that define what those native pastures and systems are. So in a reference um, grassland, typically the grazing is very low, the phosphorus is low, the nitrates are low, there's very little soil disturbance. In a native pasture, grazing can be medium to high, phosphorus can be low or can be high, we've seen medium soil disturbance low. Fertilised pasture, high nutrients and grazing is high. So we'll go through these uh, bit by bit to look at um, what your starting point is. Because everybody's been talking about today, you, you do need to know what you've got before you can manage it. Do you have a really high diversity? Because you'll be managing that differently to a lower diversity. These are reference high conservation value grasslands, really high orchids, lilies, etc. They um, uh, are pretty rare these days. We talked about shrub cover, what else is in them, some of the typical grasses. Um, so now they're mostly found in the travelling stock routes, cemeteries, Crown Reserve, some private land. I was on a property in Yas last week, 80 hectares of beautiful, uh, it's a, a cattle property of beautiful high conservation value grassland. Um, or do you maybe have a high diversity native pasture? So this is a diverse range of native species, maybe 40 to 60. Uh, it includes wildflowers and legumes, and the grasses are kangaroo grass, weeping grass, red leg and wallaby grasses. Or is it maybe a moderate diversity native pasture? So a smaller range of native uh, species, some wildflowers, some legumes, the grasses, we've got kangaroo grass dropout, red leg, wallaby, spear, wire grass. Or a low diversity native pasture. So you've got some native wildflowers left maybe, not too many, uh, maybe spear grass, red leg grass, wire grass, and quite a lot of the um, exotic annual grasses. And then the fertilised native pasture. So a lot of annual exotic grasses, ryegrass, silver grass, and some of the more phosphorant tolerant native grasses. Although, I mean, I think a lot of them are quite phosphorus tolerant. Um, it's just that as we were talking about, they get often get outcompeted. So putting this all together, and sorry, you won't be able to read this very much. And as I said, I have uh, slipped a, a copy of it um, in this booklet. But basically, oops, whoops, wrong one. Um, We've got our native grasslands pasture type that we looked at. Have a think about your place and what it uh, may be. You may have a whole range of these uh, on your property. Uh, here's the pictures again to remind you what they might look like. So this is a bit of a seasonal grazing guide. Um, we were saying grazing is one of the levers that you can use and this is what Phil was emphasising that came out of that work. Um, and as you can see, during summer, in, so this top, top bar here relates to 1A and 1B, the high conservation value and the native diverse uh, native pasture. And basically, during summer, the native grasses are seeding and establishing. So during this period, uh, keeping the grazing off allows the native grasses to seed and establish. Um, during this period here in sort of late summer, uh, March, April, May, um, short duration grazing, uh, reducing the bulk of those native perennial grasses, um, Grasses are generally more palatable a bit earlier on, you know, so late summer they're often sort of quite senescent at that stage. So really that's a key time for grazing in these very high conservation value systems. And um, because basically what happens with these native forbs, they germinate and establish right at the beginning of winter and take off during winter and then during spring to uh, grow. Uh, 
Now, it's a little bit similar. So for this moderate diversity pasture, quite similar, a bit of a break here in summer, and then grazing again, maybe uh, around March, April, May again, um, a bit of a break here to allow native forbs to germinate. And then potentially there's a bit of uh, grazing can happen in here in spring. And again, a similar thing with the uh, low diversity native pasture and the fertilised pasture. There's a, there's a bigger window for grazing, um, uh, grazing or burn here. I try to think of this in terms of that whole system too. Again, Medrith was talking, we're talking about sown pastures. So, you know, quite clearly, it's not ideal time for grazing around here. What are you going to graze on? Um, that's going to be your sown pastures. Or maybe you're rotating those pastures around which are being grazed at different times of year. So there's quite a lot to that. Um, I've sort of given you a brief overview. There's actually quite a few caveats in a sense, you know, there's no single recipe. It'll depend on your experience as well, what sort of pastures you've got. This is based on rotational grazing principles, um, no fertiliser being applied, but yeah, there is no real recipe. It depends on your starting point. And that's why often it's so hard for us to figure out how to do this, because you can't say do one, two, three, four. You can only do it according to these principles and try and apply it. So it is a little bit tricky. <laughs> So um, another real key lever is stocking density. And um, I'm, I'm not referencing this with a lot of graphs and information, but a book that we wrote, uh, Sue McIntyre, Josh Durrow and myself, Biodiversity in the Paddock, which is available um, on the Future Farms website and the CSIRO website, it has a lot of this information and the background information as well. So, as I said, different paddocks will have different plant diversity. So, when you've got that higher plant diversity, that's, we're talking about that higher end of the scale, um, the low to medium stocking density was best. So, the, the, the most diverse paddocks that we found in this work were actually continuously grazed paddocks, but they were at low stocking densities. So that sort of was typically, you know, less than four DSE per hectare. Um, more than six DSE typically reduced that plant diversity, and I'll go into that for some reasons um, a little bit more. Oh, so as I said, the most diverse pastures tended to be continuously grazed, but at these light stocking rates. So the reason the continuous grazing at this low density can provide this important <coughs> habitat and plant diversity is that you end up with more structural diversity, and that's what I'm, whoops, wrong one again. Um, so you've got sort of tussocks sitting here in between there. You've got some regen, some shrubs. It's a bit of a messy looking paddock. People don't like messy looking paddocks too much, but that's often really good for the diversity. So you often have more structural diversity. So you might have sub shrubs, tussocks, fallen timber, a range of things uh, like that, which all contribute to resources for the wildlife. So the more, so the frequent sustained heavier stocking rates eliminates those grazing sensitive species. So stock as well as kangaroos and a whole bunch of grazers just love things like orchids and wildflowers. It's the favourite one. I mean, I've been in a paddock where there's like three orchids and we've gone, isn't that marvellous? There's three orchids, come back the next day and they're all chewed off. You know, there's plenty of grass there, but that's what stock and kangaroos, in this case it was kangaroos, they, they're very tasty, they're very, they're very good. Um, and the other thing that heavier stocking rates do is tends to make it flatter, eliminating those taller tussocks. And often you don't get that tree regeneration either. So this graph is just a, a little one to say, 
it didn't really matter in terms of whether grazing was continuous or rotational, it was more related to the stocking rate, the native plant diversity per hectare. So it tended to be higher native plant diversity at these lower stocking rates, uh, which decreased as stocking rates became higher. But you've always still got some sort of diversity, even at those higher uh, stocking rates as well. So um, some of the key messages for maintaining and restoring these grassy ground layers. So these paddocks can have really significant plant, bird and reptile diversity and help you provide a good productive stable resource, particularly during rainfall, as we've been hearing. The highest diversity occurs with these lower stocking rates. So low to medium stocking rates are best. Uh, you can also seasonally manage, strategically rest your native pastures, and this is to allow active plant growth, flowering and seeding. So we've been talking about superphosphate and nutrients. So increased nutrients tend to lead to decreases in that native plant diversity. Um, and it's, I'll go through that in more detail uh, now. Oh, after this one. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, you really want to know your paddocks and uh, plan your grazing. So the timing's really important. Um, strategically resting your pastures, allowing the consolidation and, of, uh, and the spread of the native plant seeds. Now, I haven't talked about fire and burning, mowing and slashing, and there was a question before about fire. I think fire will become really important. We just don't really know how to do it really well yet. And there's lots of impediments in terms of actually getting a fire permit for an ecological burn. It's basically impossible to do. So if you do want to do an ecological burn, you have to apply for a fuel reduction permit. And Everybody's you know, not quite au fait yet with how often you do it and so on. But as I said, uh, based on Suzanne Prober's work, in the box gum woodlands, that's probably four to eight years. And it's probably going to depend. If you've had a really good run of seasons, good summer rainfall, tons of biomass, might be every four years. If you've been a very droughty, dry, year after year after year, you probably don't have a lot of biomass. So it might be once every eight years. So that will vary over time. Mowing and slashing are, are alternative tools as well. I do that at home. It really wipes out the uh, wild oats, oats and a lot of those um, species where you mow. Fantastic, microlina growing like mad. So um, it's not just all about grazing, it's just about reducing that biomass and the seeding of those species quite often. So, oh, as I mentioned before, so a lot of that information's in that booklet. So uh, we gave away all our hard copies. I think we had about 10 or 15,000 of them, but you can download that for, for more information. So going back to our state and transition model, um, we've looked at grazing. So we've said, okay, seasonality and the, and the stocking rate is really important. Now we wanna have a little look at fertilizer. Uh, which is another key driver in terms of shifting between these states. So, as you know, we typically use fertilisers, especially phosphorus, to increase productivity. And this has obviously been a really highly successful strategy and it's a key part of how you might uh, be profitable. But we are re-looking really at the use of uh, fertilisers for economic, it's very expensive these days, uh, as well as these ecological reasons. And part of that impact is um, native plants being outcompeted. So a lot of our native plants are actually quite tolerant to these phosphorus levels. And as Meredith briefly talked about, they just, they're quite slow growing. And when you get high nutrient levels, quite often you get a lot of the annual exotic grasses and they literally just outcompete a lot of our species. So that's one of the main problems. I've got, I've got plants in a climate experiment back at work, um, uh, yam, daisy and chocolate lilies, and they're growing really happily in about 35, 
cold world pee at the moment. But as I said, it's, they can tolerate that level, but they just don't grow as well or as fast as uh, the exotics. <coughs> So this is one of the diagrams out of the biodiversity um, in the paddock guide. Uh, typically, our soils were quite low in phosphorus and nitrogen, um, between that sort of five to 10 milligrams per kilogram, which is the same as Colwell P. So things like the orchids and the lilies and some of the sub shrubs are all very happy with that sort of thing. As we move into a little bit higher, uh, low nutrient levels, things like these orchids and lilies tend to drop out. Going into the medium 20 to 50 um, milligrams per kilogram, which is Kawapi again, uh, we've got some wallaby grass, a few of the annual exotics, a bit of sorrel, rye grass. Um, I do have barley grass and a few of the weeds in here, and we were talking about that's, you don't have to have that, but it's always a balancing act in a pasture not to end up with too many of these annuals. And that's what the whole focus of this, these talks have been about how you sort of avoid with the annual pastures and you maintain that perenniality in a paddock. So just, as I was saying, so most Australian soils had naturally low levels uh, of phosphorus and nitrates. Um, most of the native plants tend to take these nutrients up slowly and they have slow growth rates to match that conservative use of the nutrients. So as I just have been saying, increasing that soil fertility favours those short-lived, fast-growing plants, which are typically the exotic species, and uh, outcompetes the natives. And then potentially as well, that growth of those annual grasses and legumes in spring can use soil moisture, which is unavailable when the native plants are growing a bit later on. If you get rainfall, it's good. That'll drive the system, as Meredith said, but if not, it's a bit tougher. So what are some of the solutions to manage nutrients? Um, in this work for the biodiversity in the paddock, um, half of the producers didn't fertilise their native pastures. And part of that is uh, economic reasons. It is expensive. And I notice a lot of people do fertilise less every two to three years. Um, and also this one here, we don't want to spend too much money on paddocks that don't return much by themselves. So again, it's about knowing what you've got. Do you have a highly diverse native pasture or do you have something that's going to be more native perennial grasses and sown species and will actually respond to fertiliser, but it won't impact on that diversity. Again, within that whole sort of farm system, balancing that nutrient and fertiliser use. So as I said here, their solution, concentrating fertiliser into sown pastures and crops in the most productive paddocks, producers were finding they could reduce or stop fertilising some of the native pastures. So again, a little bit like um, Meredith's whole book picture. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily always more diverse up on the, the hill slopes, but often these are more historically farmed. So they may potentially provide more production, may have deeper soils, may have some <laughs> pastures, more fertilizer. Whereas maybe here we've got room for plant diversity, woodlands and uh, native pasture. All, all part of the system. So here are some of the key messages uh, just from that nutrient section. So we can have increased nutrients leading to decreases in plant diversity in terms of those wildflower species. And we can really only increase our diversity and shift in that state and transition model to a more diverse area if the fertility is low. Kangaroo grass is really good at pulling phosphorus out, actually. Um, you know, if you can put kangaroo grass back into a system, it often will really soak up that. Um, so, and it can be more profitable to reduce fertiliser in native pastures and concentrate its use elsewhere. 
And as we've been saying, these pastures are productive, but they do require careful grazing management to avoid dominance by annuals. So often these low fertility diverse pastures are low risk because they're, they're cheaper, they're low input, but they're low risk. You don't, they don't end up turning into an annual dominated pasture. But if you follow all of the amazing recommendations and findings by everybody here today to maintain that perennial component, um, we've had a lot of fantastic recommendations on that. Um, and there's been a lot of crossovers too, because I mean, I think stocking rate has been a key message coming through all of this as well, and timing. So just a couple of different uh, more things. Dry times, you know, your, your stock grazing pressure is quite critical. So think about what's happening during dry times. Uh, think about when you've got good summer and autumn rain, you know, can we get some seedling establishment happening, some seeding happening on the ground? As Meredith was saying, the ants are just gonna take a lot of it away. Uh, there's only gonna be certain periods of time when these plants are going to actually get all the right conditions to start germinating. So, and applying rest when, when there's good flowering and seeding. Uh, you can do some targeting of um, annual weeds in early spring as well. <coughs> so these are all things we've probably pretty well uh, gone through well. Reducing fertiliser in the areas of higher plant diversity, limiting stock grazing pressures where there is good diversity, provide a regular rest from grazing, the in varying seasons. So there's a whole range of things we can do as uh, producers and grazers uh, to maximise our plant diversity. Um, this last point, um, provide longer periods of rest if tree or shrub recruitment is evident to allow for establishment. Getting those trees back in the system, you can do revegetation, but it's much easier if you can get some natural regeneration happening. And that's actually really tricky. Um, getting trees back in the landscape. Sorry, just going back to this one, just to let you know a lot of that information is in that booklet as well, including the fire questions and some of those uh, results on the fire. So getting trees back in the landscape, um, these beautiful yellow box, which are part of the system, Blakely's red gum, even with mistletoe, fantastic for wildlife. You can have very healthy trees, even with a heavy mistletoe uh, load. Um, there's a lot of pressure on a tree out in a paddock. And these are quite common sites in terms of what you might see out in the paddock. And these are stages of senescence, stages of dieback. Now, dieback means that it's a premature and pretty rapid decline in the vigour and, and leading to the death of trees. And there's a whole lot of factors. There's leaf-eating insects, sap-sucking psyllids, Livestock don't help, they trample around the roots uh, and nutrient enrichment. The tree will actually take up the nutrients. The insects really love high nutrient leaves and will preferentially feed on that. Um, there's water tables, they can be waterlogged, they can be stressed by drought, they can be salinized, they can naturally be suffering old age. There's herbicide drift, acidification, pathogens, neutral, frost, mistletoe, burning off, all sorts of things. So the poor old trees have a lot of pressures on them and we know we've lost a lot of, out of the landscape. So I just thought I'd just briefly talk about some actions that can improve tree health. Um, so undertaking rotational grazing and or fencing or grazing exclusion actually does a huge number of things. So uh, I won't go through them all, you can have a bit of a read, but just simply by giving the trees a bit of a rest, 
uh, may be excluding stock for periods of time to allow for some of the soil uh, functioning to recover. There's, there's a whole range of things. It's quite incredible what a little bit of a break from uh, grazing will do. Um, if you can, potentially, we've lost a lot of the shrubs out of the landscape. Um, if you can tend to surround your trees with new plantings, that can attract small insectivorous birds. A lot of the thornbills, uh, Willy wagtails, a whole bunch of those fellows will glean on, they will glean and eat the psyllids and insects off the leaves and can potentially have a good impact. And again, avoid drifts from fertilisers and herbicides. Because the thing is, and this really didn't struck, strike me, and similarly, uh, I think we talked about the same thing for microlina. The really widespread conditions for tree establishment actually only really happens every 15 or 20 years because it needs so many things to happen together. And we, that means getting good quality seed. So we've got plenty of seed. But we know, as Meredith has said, as soon as there's seed, there's ants and insects. So we have to get around all of that. So you've got lots of seed. Hopefully that's going to overtake the fact that the ants are going to go in there and insect larvae are going to chew on it. Everything will eat it. Um, some bare ground, so uh, Meredith talked to that, about that briefly. Microlina, it's not so important, but for a lot of species it is. Um, so unfortunately a good drought is really good for from, uh, some bare ground and along with drought breaking rains. So these good summer rains, so have a think about the timing coming out of the drought, 2000 to 2010, below average rainfalls. We went into a wet La Nina year, 2010, in southeastern Australia. If you had wanted trees back on your property, you probably would have been in the ideal conditions. I know we took stock grazing off our place on that, at that time, just fortuitously. A good couple of two or three thousand trees, I think, are back on the place. So they're two or three thousand trees you didn't have to plant uh, and you've done. So think about that timing just in terms of how you might get that diversity back in the system because um, if you can recognise when is a good tree regeneration year and either by rotational grazing or paddock resting, you can then get some of those trees back in with minimal um, work on your part which will help the whole system. Yeah, so one of the key things is then, once your uh, trees have established grazing, give it a rest while that tree recruitment's evident, just to give it a chance to get going. So yeah, potentially get a bit of regen going and that structural diversity happening in the system. So just almost the last slide, um, weeds. So, you know, one of the principles for managing the box gum woodlands is trying to minimise those weeds. They're competing with our native species and they can lead to a decline in the diversity and the regenerative capacity of the native species. So as for all things, aiming for good ground cover. When you've got that ground cover, 70, 80, 90%, that's good. We know there's much harder for weeds to establish in that. A bit of bare ground is still good. Um, it allows particularly these wildflower species to establish. So one of the key things about grazing is that it will graze down. It won't let, say, kangaroo grass completely overtake. You need that space between the grassy tussocks for those wildflowers to germinate and grow, and other grass species. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, yeah, try to avoid soil disturbances, cultivation, ripping, um, alteration to surface water flows, 
change in soil nutrient status, and yeah, particularly over spay, spray, boom spraying to minimise the impacts. Seen some terrible things happen on some really high quality grasslands where somebody's come in to spray St John's wort and just done it, you know, uh, killed all the native grasses, everything underneath, and then you've just got a whole bunch of annual weedy things coming up. So very targeted spraying um, where possible. Okay, last slide. So how do you know if you're making a difference? How do you know if your management is actually maintaining that plant diversity or your plant diversity is actually increasing? Um, this is almost, almost ready. Probably next week it will be available. But, but we've developed a number of indicators. There's eight of them all together and there's particularly designed for land managers who don't have a level of expertise. Um, who was it? Brett. Brett was saying, I don't know what the plant is and I don't know what the plant is. This is a way of monitoring what you've got, even if you don't specifically know whether it's a, a bulbine lily or a microlina or it's phalaris. Um, it basically uses a uh, a monitoring technique along a 50 metre transect line where you're looking at, for example, uh, different types of plants. How different does it look? Is it a grass with big flat leaves? Is it a grass with a big fluffy top? Is it a yellow flowering daisy? Is it a, um, you know, purple spiky plant? It uses that and we've been getting really good results. Uh, so if, if you do know your native and exotic plants, then that's fantastic. You can use the more, uh, uh, the other version of it and actually include that. But it also uses things like, uh, is there bare ground or not? Um, is the litter decomposed or not? Um, and so forth. Anyway. It's something to keep in mind if you're interested. I know part of the na Native Grasslands program is about monitoring, but if you're interested in trying to work out what is going on, this is something that could potentially um, help you get there. So we've covered a whole range of things. Been a very long talk. Thank you very much for patiently listening. Um, but just to recap, those key levers that everybody has been talking about are you grazing? It's your timing. It's your stocking rate. It's uh, looking at what's going on in those systems and it's considering very judicious use of nutrients, knowing that they can impact on particularly the, uh, the wildflowers in terms of where you place those in your paddocks. Um, and as I said, there's a whole bunch of resources there that cover a lot of what we said. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.